Welcome. My name is Jason Barabas. I'm the director of the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and the Social Sciences. Uh, it gives me great pleasure tonight to, uh, to introduce somebody who's well known to many of you in the audience. Um, James Wright joined the Dartmouth College History Department in 1969. He earned a bachelor's degree from Wisconsin State University at Platteville and a PhD in American History from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Over the years, he has taught many students in courses such as American Political History and the History of the American West. He served as Dean of the Social Sciences, Dean of the Faculty, and Provost before then ultimately from 1998 to 2009 uh, being named as the 16th President of Dartmouth College. He's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Dr. Wright is an author of, or editor of seven books, and following his service as Dartmouth president, he taught history department seminars and has returned to his work as, as a historian publishing books that include Those Who Have Borne the Battle, A History of America's Wars, and Those Who Have Fought Them, that was in 2012, and then Enduring Vietnam, An American Generation and Its War, and that was in 2017. The latter was a finalist for the Dayton Peace Prize, Peace Price Book Award, and he has lectured widely and written over 20 op-eds. Um, next spring, Brandeis University Press will publish his book, War and American Life, Reflections on Those Who Have Served and Sacrificed. James Wright joined the Marine Corps in 1957 at the age of 17. Since 2005, he has been working to support veterans, in that year, he started visiting wounded servicemen and women in the nation's military hospitals, encouraging them to continue their education. He raised funds for a counseling program at Walter Reed and Bethesda hospitals. In 2008, he collaborated with senators uh, after the post 9-11 GI Bill, working to develop the, the Yellow Ribbon Program. Uh, he, among other things, he has been recognized for his service by the Secretary of the Army, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, the Commander-in-Chief of the Veterans of Foreign Wars, as well as being honored by ABC Television News as the Person of the Week and by the New England Council as the New Englander of the Year. Uh, he served on the board of the Semper Fi Fund and in Iraq and in in Afghanistan Veterans of America. And he's currently on the advisory board of the Marine Corps Scholarship Fund. Uh, James Wright and his wife Susan live in Hanover, New Hampshire. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome uh, President Emeritus James Wright. His talk tonight is going to be called Veterans Today and the Wars in Which They Have Served. We will follow the typical program where uh, President Wright will give remarks. We'll sit down, open it up for Q&A, and also have an opportunity for people who are watching at home to submit their questions. And I encourage you to do that with, at the address, the email address, rockyqna at dartmouth.edu. Please feel free to uh, submit those questions, and, and we'll try to get those uh, uh, answered. Uh, but with that, I want to introduce James Wright. Thank you, uh, Jason, for your very kind introduction, and we want to welcome you back to Dartmouth. It's a special honor for me to speak at an event that is sponsored by the Nelson Rockefeller Center and the John Sloan Dickey Endowment. For over 40 years, they have contributed greatly to the intellectual life of this community. And I'm pleased also to welcome Victoria Holt to Dartmouth and to the Dickey Endowment. And my special thanks to Joanne Blaise for organizing this program in a time when organizing such things has become even more complicated. On Veterans Day, just 10 years ago, I spoke in Rockefeller III as a Veterans Day speaker. Of course, in 2011, we did not have to wear masks, and there was no virtual streaming of my presentation. At that time, I had been involved for six years in visiting military hospitals. I would finally do that over 30 times always encouraging wounded veterans to continue their education. And early on, I had expanded that engagement to work more broadly with others to encourage all veterans to go to school, including working on the GI Bill in 2008. But by 2011, I had become a historian again, an advocate. In my remarks 10 years ago, I provided an overview 
of America's wars and their veterans. In many regards, this was a preview of my book, Those Who Have Borne the Battle, which was released the following year. In writing that book, though, I thought a lot about just how much the nature of our wars had changed. And with, with that change, our understanding, the general public's understanding of wars and their veterans. I think the Vietnam War signaled that change emphatically. And it was even clearer in the wars in which we were then engaged in Iraq and Afghanistan. And my remarks today will provide a summary of my engagement with these issues over the last decade in trying better to understand this change and its consequences. My interest has been in telling the story of those who have fought in these wars, as it was increasingly clear that fewer people knew about, or quite frankly, even thought about them and the changes in warfare. So I guess the old, the old teacher and the old historian came back. This focus was actually previewed on Veterans Day 2009, 12 years ago. I spoke at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington. I told that day the story of two names that were on the wall. One was a soldier who had served with the 101st Airborne from my hometown, and the other was a Dartmouth graduate, the Marine, Billy Smoyer. I said to the assembled group there that day, casualties of war cry out to be known as persons, not as abstractions called casualties, nor as numbers entered into the books, and not only as names chiseled into marble or granite. We need to ensure that here in this place of memory, lives as well as names are recorded. Lives with smiling human faces, with remarkable accomplishments, with engaging personalities, and with dreams to pursue. We remember them for them, for history, and for those in the future who will send the young to war. In so many ways, preparing those remarks sharpened my sense of what I might contribute to understanding better those who served. My purpose just randomly was more sharply underlined a few years later when Susan Wright and I saw the play Hamilton on Broadway. Walking down the street after seeing that play, I kept thinking of Eliza Hamilton's refrain, who lives, who dies, who tells your story? However much we may abstract and sanitize the accounts, we need always remember that war is about who lives and who dies. And let us be clear, this is the purpose of war, to determine who dies. And I think it's critical that the story of those involved in these lethal dramas be told and understood that we know them as individuals rather than abstract them as numbers. For we have to recognize numbers can numb our recognition of their humanity. When those engaged in wars are reduced to anonymous figures in distant places, to video games engaged in by drones, to mimetic little boots dancing on the ground, Wars become too easy to celebrate or to romanticize or simply to forget about. In researching my book on the Vietnam War, my effort was to tell the story of the generation who fought and died in Vietnam. And I did a number of interviews with veterans primarily, but also with some journalists who served in Vietnam and some family members of those who did not return. Of all of these accounts, many of them very powerful and moving, when I think of them even today, some of the things that people shared with me and told me, I think that probably no interview revealed better the compounding human cost of war 
than one I had with a man who shared with me his experiences in June of 1969. He was just completing eighth grade at that time. He was in his Pennsylvania home alone late one afternoon when he saw a green car stop in front of the house. Two soldiers got out of the house and walked toward the door. He told me he greeted them enthusiastically when they asked if his parents were home. He replied that they were out, but he thought his mother would be there in any minute. He asked them to come in, and he told me that he was so excited to see these two soldiers, he could not wait to talk to them. He said to them, I have a brother in the Army. My brother is a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. And he told them he was so excited because his brother would be completing his tour and coming home to Pennsylvania the next month. He proudly showed them his brother's picture in uniform, and he asked them, do you know my brother? They looked away, indicating they did not. When his mother came home, they told her that they regretted to inform her that her son had been shot down and was missing in action in the Republic of Vietnam. He said his mother went into a state of shock, and he was so stunned that he ran to a corner and just wept. Soon his father came home and joined them, although my interviewee recalled that his father just seemed to be numb in a state of shock with the news. The next day, when the boy came home from a friend's house, there were several neighbors and relatives in his house, and he came in and saw they were all crying. The Army officers had returned and told the parents that their son's body had been found and identified. The young teenager said he hugged his grandmother and they just cried together. His brother had died on June 6th, 1969. He remembered his father saying he would never forget that date because just 25 years before that, he had gone ashore on the beach at Normandy. Three generations touched by war. Who tells their story? Fundamental changes in combat have reduced significantly the number and the visibility of the participants or of the loved ones who are prepared to tell the story. Wars in Vietnam, in Iraq, and Afghanistan these were not my father's wars. He served in the Army in Europe in World War II. They were not the wars of the Pennsylvania father that I just mentioned. After Normandy, he also fought in the Battle of the Bulge. For my generation, Normandy and Iwo Jima really defined war. I recall my Marine Corps training in the 1950s. We still climbed down cargo nets onto landing craft. And I recall one large scale maneuver where we assaulted what was defined as an enemy held beach. It was a lovely beach on the island of Kauai in the Hawaiian Islands. Starting with Vietnam, to some extent even Korea, the nature and the goals of modern combat has changed. There were rules of engagement in these recent wars, areas that were nominally off-limit sanctuaries, and there were shifting political goals. Military force had become just one tactical tool in broader and shifting political goals. Sun Chu observed some 2,500 years ago that tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. Combat operations in Vietnam were about engaging an elusive enemy, but they were not about seizing and holding territory. There were no flag raisings like the iconic one on Iwo Jima in February of 1945. In fact, 
there were no American flags that would fly in these places, trying to insist this was not an American war. I would suggest that apart from obvious differences in gunpowder and technology, that Achilles or Alexander the Great would have recognized the basic flow of combat at Iwo Jima, of one armed force engaging and fighting another. They would recognize Iwo Jima probably better than Iwo Jima veterans might have recognized most skirmishes of the wars in this century. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were never called police actions, the way President Truman unfortunately had described the engagement in Korea. But in so many ways, they might have been, maybe even more than the war in Korea might have been. I have always struck by a, a, an account by the late Colin Powell which he described his first trip to Vietnam as an advisor in 1963. He was serving with the South Vietnamese Arvin unit up in the Asha Valley. The Asha Valley was up in the northwestern part of the old Republic of South Vietnam near Laos. He went to this base and as the South Vietnamese commander there gave him an introduction to the place and the surroundings, Powell asked him why they were positioned there of all places. Why was this base here? The reply was that the base, the outpost was very important. And when Powell asked why was it important, he was told it was important in order to protect the airstrip down below. So then he asked, okay, so what's the purpose of this small grass airstrip down there? And the answer was, of course, it's there to supply the outpost. <laughs> General Powell would later say that he seldom heard a better explanation of so many of the postings out in the back country of Vietnam. Over 50 years after he was there, I visited the Asha Valley and I climbed Dong Ap Bia, the Vietnamese mountain that those who fought there called Hamburger Hill. I was joined in my climb that day by an American veteran and two North Vietnamese who had fought the Americans of the 101st Airborne Division there. In May of 1969, on this hill in desolated, lonely Vietnam, there was a pitched battle that lasted for 10 days. This was quite an anomaly in Vietnam where most engagements lasted an hour and sometimes much less. And so two weeks after securing the hill with very heavy casualties, the United States Army abandoned it. They said that this costly fight had not been about winning and holding territory it had been to assault the North Vietnamese that were there. There were no American flags that flew over the top of this captured hill stating we have won, we have victory. And when I climbed it at the top as a monument that said that it was installed by the Socialist Republic of Vietnam in which it says they were celebrating their great victory there and it was. It was not in May of 1969, but finally it was their great victory. I sometimes think of my 2014 visit to an area southwest of Da Nang in Vietnam, an area that the Marines serving over there called Dodge City. I was visiting two sites where people I interviewed had, had fought. I was over there trying to visit some of the battlegrounds that I was going to write about. I also wanted to visit the places where two Dartmouth Marines, members of the class of 1967, Billy Smoyer and Duncan Slay, had died. I visited in one day four sites where these men were killed. 
but they were killed over a 10-month period in 1968-69. And these battles occurred in an area that was probably no more than 15 square miles. Young Marines fought in the same rice paddies and the same trails over and over and over again. And young Marines died there. This describes in so many ways the Vietnam War, a war of ambushes and small unit assaults that often was fought over the same ground month after month after month. In 1944, the fathers of the Vietnam generation fought for 11 weeks, moving 100 miles from Omaha Beach to Paris, liberating, securing, and holding. This was the way that World War II was fought. Anyone who has served on combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan would understand well the way of war that marked Vietnam. I might even say to some of the young veterans and ROTC students here that probably anyone who served in Iraq and Afghanistan would understand the war in Vietnam and that Normandy is as distant to their experience as is Gettysburg. In these 21st century wars, we have asked our military forces to confront a fundamental question. How does a heavily armed military force fight when the only strategic goal is not defeat of an enemy army in the field, not securing their unconditional surrender, but instead is an elusive war on terror. Terror is a violent attitude. It's a, an ideology. It's fostered in cells and secret enclaves among committed believers, many of whom are willing to die. Terrorists do not march as an army in the field, and defeating this enemy requires many tools, and military force is seldom the primary one that it requires. We saw previews of the use of the military to convert hearts and minds in Vietnam. In Iraq and Afghanistan, these previews morphed into a 20-year production. Many American service members had multiple deployments, and they found themselves walking the same ground, time after time after time, seeking to protect it, but ironically, in order to do this, almost inviting an assault from an enemy, an enemy that had no clear base of operations. In 2013, I wrote an op-ed piece that appeared in The Atlantic, and I reflected in that on the 10th anniversary of President George W. Bush landing on the carrier Abraham Lincoln in May of 2003. Behind him on the ship was this huge banner proclaiming mission accomplished. I noted that in the years following this, as the war in Iraq intensified, many would use this moment, this photograph, to criticize the president and others for claiming victory when the war would continue for years. But in my op-ed in 2013, I argued that, ironically, that banner was correct. The military had accomplished its mission in Iraq by the spring of 2003. Saddam Hussein was in hiding. There was a new government in place. And we had completed our search for weapons of mass destruction. In fact, I said the war in Afghanistan also had its mission accomplished within several weeks. The Taliban were routed, were no longer controlling the government, and Osama bin Laden was hiding someplace in, a, in Pakistan. But then, in each place, 
Iraq and Afghanistan, the goals and the goalposts moved from military to political missions. And this past August, we saw the playing out of these shifting and expanding objectives as they happened in Afghanistan. American efforts to modernize Afghanistan agriculture and its economy, to provide for more representative governments in the villages, to provide education for young women as well as men, to insist upon a democratic society, these are all laudable goals. Few Americans would dispute that these are good things. But there were, in Afghanistan, cultural and religious and tribal and historic cross-currents that very few Americans understood. So young American service members deployed over there often functioned as agricultural extension agents, civil mediators, economic development advisors, and finally, as security forces, as police. And the same basic processes played out in Iraq. As many as three million Americans served in Afghanistan and Iraq over the last 20 years. But over half of these were deployed more than once. And they did this in an environment where the governments were often too corrupt and many people, most of the citizens, just as was the case in Vietnam, simply wanted to be left alone. Watching the Afghanistan withdrawal this, this past summer, I thought of the last months of the Korean War in the summer of 1953. A negotiated truce was in sight. And American troops who were engaged in heavy fighting on Pork Chop Hill, allegedly said they just wanted to survive, that, quote, no one wants to die for a tie. And that negotiated truce from the summer of 1953 continues, uneasily to be certain, nearly 70 years later. Korean War veterans insisted they had accomplished their mission when I would talk to them, they would always say, our goal was to repel the North Korean invasion and protect the Republic of Korea. Of course, they might have noted that goal had expanded in the fall of 1950 when we thought, well, why not go north? Why not go north, which ended up with terrible fighting when the Chinese came in with the Eighth Army and then the Marines up at the Chosan Reservoir. Veterans of Vietnam confronted in 1975 the news that the North Vietnamese had occupied Saigon. It would be hard for anyone to say there was a tie there. But as one Vietnam ar veteran argued emphatically after the fall of Saigon, we didn't lose. We were withdrawn. And now, veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan wonder about the results, even more fundamentally, the meaning of their wars. While troops remain deployed in Iraq today, clearly American military engagement there is ending. Veterans of these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan share the frustration of those who came before them. They know they had prevailed in the field when there was a military encounter, they pretty regularly came out on top. And they can remind us they didn't lose. But now places like Fallujah and Kandahar can evoke Quezon and Hamburger Hill, places where we fought with tremendous casualties, where we secured the geographic objective and then withdrew. A decade ago, I remember a conversation I had with a 
senior uh, army veteran. He had served as a major officer in Vietnam in the 1960s. And he, along with Colonel Harry Summers, met a North Vietnamese officer after the war, a couple years after 1975. And they said to him, when they were talking about the war, you know you never defeated us on the battlefield. And the North Vietnamese response was quite simple. That may be so, but it is also irrelevant. Could you ever imagine a Nazi officer saying that to a 10th Mountain Division officer? The final days in Afghanistan provided stunning examples of the difficulty of military engagement against enemy forces who were able to slip in and out of the civilian population. They showed the difficulty of combat operations in defense of a democratic government that was no longer defensible or democratic, and indeed, in August, no longer even was there. The suicide bomber who killed 13 Americans and 170 civilians at the Kabul airport was but one of the larger tragic examples of the difficulty of defending against such murderous assaults. And three days later, the American drone strike that mistakenly killed 10 innocent Afghan civilians in an effort to head off another such assault tragically underlined the limits of most modern military technology and the fatal consequences of many of our attempts to preempt attacks. I think those last several days in August were the war and microcosm. We deployed American troops, and they are not functioning as combat troops, but as police, as security guards, as processors of paper and credentials, trying to sort through a milling large crowd of civilians just wanting to get inside the airport. And it was a suicide bomber, not an enemy soldier in uniform, who killed them and large numbers of Afghans. And then, in an effort to preempt another attack, all of the modern technology was unable to distinguish friend or foe. And so innocent friends, innocent children, died as a result of this. The American media gave wide coverage to the 13 Americans killed in the suicide bombing, and many also described the Afghans who were killed in the drone strike. There were, on television and newspapers and magazines, poignant profiles of the Marines and the Navy corpsmen who died due to the suicide bomber. And these provided human faces for a war marked by suffering that had been largely unseen in this country that's anonymous. The modern all-volunteer force represents less than 1% of our population, about a half a percent. And it's not a representative sample of our population either. Those who serve tend to come more from rural areas and small towns than they do from urban areas. They tend to come more from the south and the west, more than the northeast or the urban west coast. They often come from families where parents, grandparents, or older siblings or other relatives have served themselves. It's becoming more and more a family affair. And often the major issues of the all-volunteer force that receive the most attention are those that mirror major issues in our society. Racism and racial inequity, misogyny, glass ceilings, sexual assault and sexual harassment, and issues of sexual identity and sexual orientation. The US military has not handled these things very well, but nor has our society handled these things very well. 
A 2020 Pentagon report described the composition of the current active duty force. Among the enlisted ranks, blacks and Hispanics were overrepresented and whites were overrepresented among the officers. In these wars in this century, most Americans do not know anyone who has served and they do not really understand the nature of the wars in which they have fought. Small unit actions, I mean, we're talking about platoon and sometimes squad level engagements. Small unit actions lacking dramatic victories with relatively small numbers of casualties have not generated front page stories the way those airport killings did in late August. But as, as is true in all wars, away from the front pages are the stories of human suffering by those serving and their families. PTSD, cognitive brain injuries, and the physical wounds of war are often observed markers of this suffering. We are saving so many more in these wars that are wounded on the battlefield than we're able to save in Vietnam and certainly in World War II. We're saving them, but they're pretty banged up in some cases. And we've come to recognize they're banged up, many of them in, in a lot of ways. Over four times more service members have committed suicide in the last 20 years than were killed in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. The great tragic irony is that these costs, because they are far from the front page, are easier to tolerate politically. And we've really seen that for the last 20 years. The Vietnam War generated a political firestorm because of the numbers who were deployed there and the fact that the draft made more Americans and their families vulnerable to sharing the human costs of war. The ending of the draft and the use of multiple deployments rather than a larger military has served to reduce even more the public engagement of really knowing what's happening. And these have been the first sustained wars in American history without a special tax to pay for them. Most Americans have had no skin in the game. In this morning's, just this morning's Washington Post, E.J. Dion wrote, we need to consider what it means that a large proportion of our nation's leadership has never known what it is like to face combat. Its members have never had to risk their lives carrying out decisions made far away. They do not have to bear the physical and emotional scars of battle long after the war's end. Early in our war in Afghanistan, one soldier deployed over there quipped, we have gone to the war and America has gone to the mall. It was quite a tension gathering as a statement at that time. But you know what? Ironically, the nature of consumer shopping <laughs> has changed more dramatically in the last 20 years than has been the way that we deploy our young troops to war. I have come over the last 20 years to have a tremendous respect and regard for those who have served during the wars of this century, as well as for those who served during the Vietnam War. My engagement encouraging our youngest veterans to pursue their education has been very rewarding. We badly need them to do this. And this is not some sort of a thank you for your service gratuity. It's more than that. Let me share with you a few comments I made a couple years ago to a meeting on this campus of student veterans from a number of schools. I said to them then, in recent years, there has been an unfortunate marked decline in this nation in a shared sense of civic engagement and of civic responsibility. You who have volunteered to serve stand for something different. There is no draft conscripting you. You still understand 
John Kennedy's plea in January of 1961 to ask not what the country can do for you, but what you can do for the country. Could you imagine any politician running for office today who would say that? How tragic that is. Senator John McCain described it as fighting for a cause larger than yourself. I said to those student veterans, you know how to serve as a team member. You have worked effectively with others of different backgrounds. You followed orders and also assumed personal responsibility and accountability. You functioned in complex organizations in an advanced technological environment and you have confronted dangerous situations in environments where you depend totally on mutual dependence. You stand and your comrades, your buddies stand with you. You depend so much one on the other. You have learned discipline and restraint and self-confidence and tolerance. You have represented this nation in undertakings that emphasize respecting those of different cultures. You have offered and you have observed service and sacrifice for a common good. So we need you, I said to them, to continue to serve and to make a positive difference. We so badly in this republic today need the voices of Americans seeking to continue to serve their country, their entire country. I can only underline and emphasize those comments today. We still so badly need you veterans to continue to stand up and serve. And so on this day, as on all days, I would want to conclude by saying to those who have served, thank you for your service. And for those who have not served, I urge you to thank them as well but also to look for ways to understand what they have done at our request. Never forget that. They have served at our nation's request. And perhaps as you come to understand better who they are and what they are doing, maybe someday you can respond positively, and I hope not in the same tragic situation, but respond positively to the question, do you know my brother? And now I would expand that inquiry, that plea, to include, do you know my sister? Many thanks for joining us here this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic. So we'll move over to the middle. I will um, start the Q&A period. I guess I, I first want to say thank you for your service. Um, it, is, it is truly an honor to, to, to have somebody here. I was struck, you, you arrived on campus in 1969. I was trying to go back to that, that moment when the draft is going, the Vietnam is run. We're years away from concluding the Vietnam War. Uh, can you just tell me a little bit about what it was like when you arrived uh, during that 1969 year? Yeah, I, I drove from Madison, Wisconsin in the August of 1969. To, I'd never been to New England until I came here for a job interview the previous year. And uh, drove through upstate New York to cut across Vermont to Hanover and Woodstock. Concert was just breaking up. And so the, the, the roads and the highways and byways were filled with young people hitchhiking and, and remember the old micro buses with all of the psychedelic colors on them and people shouting and having a good time leaving Woodstock. And then I came here and, and there was a, a major tension on campus because the previous spring uh, had been marked by the occupation of Parkhurst Hall in a protest against the war and the draft. And there were college hearings, college disciplinary hearings for those who had done that that fall. So the, the campus was divided in debating this. And then the following spring, 
was the, uh, when President Nixon sent the troops into Cambodia in April of 1970. Uh, so many campuses in this country, including this one, sort of splintered as a result of that. And we ended up calling off classes for, for uh, uh, two or th the last two or three weeks of the term uh, that year because everyone was so totally absorbed in trying to protest the war and the extension of the war into Cambodia. So that was what I came to. None of it was surprising. I'd been at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for the previous five years, so I had uh, ample uh, orientation to have seeing a divided campus. It was right after I left Madison that there was a major bomb that went off in the math building that killed a couple of people. Uh, it's important to remember all that. I, there's so many different parts. I want to make sure we uh, allow time for the, the audience members, both here and, and virtually, to, to, to come in on this. But you started your talk by talking about the nature of wars has changed, and you went through many conflicts. You talked about Normandy and Iwo Jima, and then all the way through to the present uh, and, and uh, all the wars since. And then you, you, toward the end of your talk, you talked also about E.J. Dion's article about leaders. And I was struck, but before this talk, I, I, I noticed a report that said there are fewer veterans in Congress than ever before, right? So, uh, for example, in the, in the, in the, from the high of post-war high of the 80% of people who had been veterans to down, now 17% or something like that. So I was wondering in some ways if, if the, cha the change in wars is, is somewhat reflected in the change of the composition of political leadership in the United States or or other technology. Yeah, I, I think that the, the fact that the, right now, I think the military needs maybe 175, 180,000 new uh, recruits every year. And that's uh, the 18-year-old population in the country is probably nearly four and a half million. So which 175,000 uh, are going to serve? And obviously, it's just a smaller fraction of our population, and it's not likely to get that much larger. So you're going to see fewer veterans. Uh, uh, you know, so many veterans are, are my age, and you know, if it was certainly in their 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, that's where the, uh, the bulk of the veteran population is today. I think Vietnam veterans may be the most numerous, but that won't be much longer. And the veterans will start to get younger pretty soon as the old World War II and Korea and Vietnam generations move on. Uh, so it's not surprising that there are fewer veterans in Congress. Uh, I think there need to be, I think there need to be at the table when we're talking about war and peace, people who understand what the consequences of that are. Not, not, not as some sort of a, uh, a war game at a table, uh, uh, not some sort of a, uh, diplomatic foray, but what it means uh, to go on the ground. Uh, I wrote an article a few years ago talking about the metaphor that many politicians use about putting boots on the ground. And I said it's just another way to uh, dehumanize war. Uh, the people have to realize those boots on the ground have our sons and daughters inside of those boots who are wearing them, who are there. And that uh, for many in the military, a symbol of boots on the ground going back to the Vietnam War and certainly in Iraq and Afghanistan is what they call the battlefield cross, which they fix a bayonet on the end of a weapon, stick it in the ground, put a helmet on the top, and put a pair of empty combat boots uh, next to it. And that's what boots in the ground mean. I'd like more people able to understand that consequence rather than thinking it's a board game, we'll move some troops here, we'll move some troops there. And, and, and I surely am not trying to say people who haven't served are indifferent to that. They are, and uh, we just need to get more people engaged in recognizing the consequences of deploying troops. Wars are far easier to start than they are to stop. That's been proved so many times, but you can more or less unilaterally decide to start a war, but as soon as that war begins, you're engaging other countries, other people with different agendas, more conflicting agendas, and all of a sudden just saying, okay, now we're gonna declare victory and go home, is not as easy as it would because you no longer have total control.
over the way that plays out. Um, that, that brings me, our, so our co-sponsors tonight are the Dickey Center for International Understanding. You, you touched upon diplomacy. I guess I want to take it a little bit in that direction, how the nature of military service and being familiar with what it means to, to see those iron crosses, to see, to see the casualties, and to, to recognize that, how that changes diplomacy going forward, as well as other, other aspects of warfare that are changing, such as cyber warfare. We have a space core now, drones. So I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the changing wars, the technology, and, and what these conflicts mean, and, and the implications for diplomacy. Yeah, I think that, that uh, you know, what it means is that many of us are able to assume that cyber war and drones are the way wars are fought. And, and obviously, uh, the, these are powerful weapons that can be used in war, but uh, uh, people finally recognize that you have to get some troops in if you really want to secure a place. You can't do it with drones. But I think it's too easy for us uh, today to, to think, well, you know, so there are a few kids serving over there, they'll be fine, and it's, uh, I haven't seen a, any sight of a battle for a long time, everything is okay. I think what, what's happened is that even the distinction between combatants and non-combatants in, in the war zone and the military have changed. In Vietnam, it was pretty clear that it was the Army infantry and paratroopers and, and Marine Corps grunts. These are out in the, the back country doing the fighting. Uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's, it, it's anybody who travels on a road, anybody who goes on and off of a base, anyone who's doing anything as part of a service to the troops in the field that puts themselves vulnerable because you never know when a bridge or a culvert or something you're passing over is going to explode. And uh, that has led to so many more casualties. And I think the distinction between combat units and, and others has changed. Those who are not in combat units are certainly still facing these, these tragic situations regularly. Okay, why don't we uh, take this moment to open it up to the audience. I invite you, if you have questions, to come down and ask them at the microphone. We also want you to submit questions through the online channels at Rocky Q and A at Dartmouth.edu. Uh, so please feel free to send those in if you haven't done so already. Are there any questions uh, from members of the audience? And I see anyone. Come on, somebody's got to have some questions out there. Uh, we have a question right here. Hello. Uh, thank you for coming and speaking with us. Um, also, thank you. Again, your work with the GI Bill and the Yellow Ribbon Program is the reason I'm at Dartmouth um, and the reason I can afford to come <laughs> to Dartmouth. Um, right now, like, there's a lot of political tension and polarization in our country, and it's kind of left me feeling and some other veterans feeling as if um, we can't both hold our country um, dear and love it while also leveraging critique. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how you <laughs> have been able to do so for so long and still kind of manage to, to, to do to both love your country and be critical of it. Oh, I think if you really love the country, you, you, you better be critical of it. You better continually be trying to improve it. You better be engaging and trying to help out. Uh, and, and I think that we've, we've lost a little bit of that, and, and that's unfortunate, because if anybody who offers a criticism is considered unpatriotic or un-American, uh, that, that certainly goes against the grain of this republic, as I understand it. And uh, uh, when you're in the military, you may have to be more cautious about what you say and who you criticize. But uh, this republic depends upon people who do love their country and recognize that, that uh, perfection uh, can only ever be a goal. It'll be never something complete where you say that's done and just have to continue to work on it. And that's why I think we need uh, veterans like you and others uh, who are willing to continue to serve and to try to make a difference. We, we badly need your voices now. I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled, as are many people, by the state of the Republic today and what's going on. We have another question. Go ahead. 
Good evening, sir. Uh, thanks so much for this. Such a great talk. Uh, my name's Anat. I'm active duty. Um, I'm currently at Dartmouth as an emergency medicine resident. I served in Afghanistan. My question has to do with uh, the point you were making about how the number of people who are serving seem to be almost like its own caste system, where it's just like it runs in the family. Yeah. What is your opinion? Uh, General McChrystal made the point that perhaps there needs to be some type of service obligation in the country. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the military, but through a variety of other organizations. Do you think there's a value in instituting something where you have to serve your country before you, in some capacity, not necessarily the military, but te like I did AmeriCorps before yeah. I went to medical school. Um, something like that so that people can get a sense of service. Sir. Uh, I do. I think we've lost a, a great deal by not having a sense of service, of, of serving some cause and, and uh, uh, some, some objective that's bigger than your own more narrow and, and personal ones. My problem is trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, I don't think the military is going to suddenly require more than 175, maybe 200,000 more people a year. And so, I, and, and so I, I don't think you can, you could go to a draft and I guess in a lottery system, but that would be complicated. And I know the military just soon have the 175,000 who want to be there rather than somebody who spends all of their time complaining and say, I was supposed to be starting school at Lehigh this fall, and look, you've sent me here. I didn't want to be here. We, we went through that during the Vietnam War. So the question is some sort of non-military service obligation. And, and I really like the idea. My difficulty is trying to think of it as an obligation. Uh, if, if you, we need to find better, far better carrots to encourage people to do that. But if, if we had it as, as a obligation, as a requirement for every 18 or 20 year old, could, could, could you imagine our Congress today, our government agreeing on what would be the things they would do that would count towards satisfying this goal? Could you imagine that discussion and how it would go? And, and, and can we imagine what we would do? It's, it's one thing uh, to penalize somebody who goes AWOL or 60 years ago, somebody who ignored their draft notice, but if somebody doesn't sign up uh, for a public service project in medicine or conservation or any of a number of ways, what's the punishment going to be for that and who's going to punish them? And I just worry greatly about how we could ever do it, even though I very much like the idea of serving and of trying to make a difference. So I, I would like us to, to have a culture where more people would understand, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And uh, I would like us to encourage more people to do it. It would not have to be all four and a half million people who just turned 18. Uh, no more than, you know, the, the baby boomers that fought in Vietnam, about 40% of the men of that generation served in the service. It was higher than many people would have thought but uh, it's still a lot of people who didn't serve. So I, I don't know how you fix it, I, but I, I, I agree with your sense of frustration and need an opportunity here. I just don't know how we take advantage of that. Excellent question and, and policy relevant as well. Uh, we have another one right here. Hey, how are you? I'm Jacob. Um, I'm a reporter for the D, but uh, thank you for being here today and speaking. I just have a question myself about um, the intersection of academia and the military. You know, we mentioned needing boots on the ground, sorry, we mentioned needing, you know, military expertise at the table when discussing, you know, strategy and military planning, but what hand does, like, academia have in, in good military planning, and what's the, what's the balance, would you say, the intersection there? What, what role does academia have? And Well, I, I, I think a number of people, you know, uh, there are not probably that many officially uh, that, that are serving in a, in a role as advisor or doing this, but I, I, I think that the research uh, that people do, uh, their publications, you know, some, some of the work that Jay is working on, Jay Lyle in the government department, I think that needs better to inform people who are making the decisions. Uh, I don't sometimes know what it is that does inform them and, and, and what they're thinking about. I think that everything has become so politicized and. And, and I think these issues, 
war and peace, public service, you know, can't be politicized. It does. I, I, I'm, I'm, I taught political history for many years. Politics is part of the part of the, the, the world in which we live. And okay, but th there's got to be a different form of politics with more give and take, more compromise. When 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 I was uh, younger, people worked across the aisle to compromise. Were called statesmen or stateswomen, and, and now they're called sellouts, and people want to throw them. Uh, out of the cult, uh, out of the tribe, and I think that's that's very unfortunate. A good point. We have a time for one or two more. We'll we'll take these two questions, and I think I think we're getting toward the end. Uh, right here. I'm Harlan Fair, class of '53, Sarah School '54, and uh, I recognized when I was on active duty that uh, there's a big element of the, from the West, the Southwest, and, and the uh, leadership of, of the Corps, uh, Civil Engineer Corps and so forth. And I always thought that if we have a, an Ivy League graduate, a Dartmouth graduate, uh, that that was a positive influence on the Civil Engineer Corps and the Navy in, in total. I'm a retired Navy person. Uh, so I, I just wonder if, if you have any thoughts on, it's great to really have a, an Ivy Leaguer there. Uh, what I spend my time on is to concentrate on those people that have been on active duty, multi uh, deployments in particular, and have spent a lot of time, are they recognized are they getting the veterans' benefits? Are they getting the uh, uh, retirement ben benefits and so forth like I am? Uh, so anyway, my, most of my military career has been uh, in, in the reserves, but not all of it, active duty and reserves, and I am retired. I do think that, that, that we need to have more Ivy League graduates. I mean, you know, if, if, if those of us who have spent a lot of years talking about the value of an education at a place like this. Uh, we have to try to affirm its value and, 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 and having more graduates uh, serving in one way or another uh, is, is very important. And we've had uh, quite a few who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan. I, I couldn't give you the exact numbers, but there have always been some over there. And uh, I think that's, that's important. The question of, of benefits, uh, I think that the, the VA has, has certainly been tr working hard to try to think of the benefits unique uh, to these wars and to this generation. I think their biggest obstacle is, is dealing with uh, women, veterans who are serving, but that's uh, an obstacle that in the active duty armed forces they haven't always figured out very well either. Uh, I think that the VA is trying, they're doing better, whether it's the right package of, of, uh, of investments, uh, I don't know. I know there's a, I was on a seminar panel at, at Georgetown last spring and we talked about the all volunteer force and, and what was happening. And, and, and there was one person there that, that, that I knew, I had worked with him before, he did a reading in fact of one of my manuscript who he had taught at West Point, he had lost a leg in, in, in Iraq and uh, he had a book out, and he, he's, he takes the view that the military benefits package is, is geared more toward some sort of lifetime entitlement rather than thinking, okay, what can we do to enable this person uh, to be a fully functioning member of society in a way that they want to be, that it's too much sort of a, a lifetime benefit rather than what, what, do, what can we do for you right now? to make certain that you can uh, function and take care of yourself in this world. And I have some sympathy with that, but I, I think it's a more complicated matter than that I'm prepared to figure out how, how we would better do that. And, and I think what we're, we're doing a better, you know, the big issue now are the burn pits and other things that we know have, are, have been causing uh, terrible medical problems. 
we went through that after Vietnam uh, with PTSD, uh, certainly, with Agent Orange. Uh, and I think that the VA and the government is trying to respond a little more rapidly today to the burn pits issue. They've not responded rapidly enough by any means, but I think they're trying to, to recognize that there's a, a whole set of other issues. And I think that's, that's what we have to continue to work on. It's, 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 if you look at the traditional wounds of war, there are uh, prosthetic devices, there are medical treatments, there are all sorts of things that, that can help a person. But so many of the wounds of war today are things that are not visible necessarily. And, and, and the nature of the people who are serving today is that they, they may go back to a part of the country where it's still not that comfortable to say I'm having serious nightmare and, and emotional problems. I mean, the, the part of the world I grew up in, I would hope today you could say that, but I'm not sure you could have 20 or 30 years ago. It was just not what you did. And, and I think that's unfortunate. And the VA, I think, has to be more proactive and aggressive in doing that. They, they failed the Vietnam generation uh, pretty badly. They thought the Vietnam generation were a bunch of uh, hippie uh, flower power uh, uh, drugged out people and, and the, the World War II generation was really staffing the VA at that time and th they did not take to the Vietnam generation very well. So it took a while for the VA really to catch up with the needs of the Vietnam generation. I don't think that's been nearly as much of a problem for the wars of this century. Excellent. Uh, we, we have one more question and I think uh, we will um, then consider these issues beyond that. Jim, thanks. Thanks for those great comments. Wonderful to hear from you. As always, uh, I'm Jim Bullion, 78, uh, Tuck 82. And I related to your, your thought about the, uh, the generational aspects of it all. My grandfather was in World War I, my father World War II, Korea, my brother in Vietnam. I went to Iraq and Afghanistan, and my daughter went to Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> so we've been through it all, and it does, does run in families. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask your thoughts about, uh, this morning in the Wall Street Journal, General H.R. McMaster wrote an, an editorial about uh, how the best way to thank a veteran is to win a war. And how these wars that all these young people are being sent off to end up in these stalemates, like you say, the tie in, in Korea, or complete failures and surrenders in some people's views as we, uh, a lot of us believe, just happened in Afghanistan. And I'd be interested in your thoughts about how that into a war uh, impacts on a veteran versus yeah. being able to finish the oh, job. Oh, I, I, think, I think it hurts, and I, I think veterans could speak to that better than I could. I, I, I did interview a number of Vietnam veterans and had their input on this, and, and it, it, it's kind of interesting, Jim. A lot of them and, and some, some of the accounts I've read of veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan say the same thing. You know, they're, they're, they're horrified that, that, that they and their friends sacrificed so much, and now we just sort of walk away and let the enemy take over, whether it's in Saigon or Kabul. Uh, on the other hand, they say pretty unanimously, uh, we would not want to go back. With, you know, it's, maybe, maybe we've done all we can over there, and I think that's, that's the catch-22 of this. I did not uh, see the McMaster uh, uh, opinion piece today. Uh, he wrote a very powerful book uh, on the Vietnam War saying that, that basically uh, the military command structure had failed the civilian leadership because they, they didn't give them always an honest, they, they told President Johnson and others what President Johnson wanted to hear rather than giving him an honest assessment. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, it's, things are not that bad today, uh, but it's not clear to me that, that, that uh, the military and, and certainly uh, Obama or Trump or, or Biden are, are necessarily saying, here's the hard choice and here's what's going to happen if you do it this way. And it, it's a very tricky place to be in a republic that really counts on civilian control of the military. But the military does have an obligation. Uh, you know, I, I had a note yesterday from somebody who had been a senior general that I know and had, had served uh, in a lot of ways. And he, 
he made reference to the surrender in Afghanistan, and that's you know that's that's his description of what happened there. And and uh, I I think that uh, it's going to take a while for this all to fall out and, and settle down. It it did from Vietnam, and I think it will as well from Afghanistan. But most of the, you know we have some veterans here tonight of. Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't know how many of them would say, I was ready to go back, we shouldn't have pulled out, let's do it again, or let's send my younger brother or sister over. I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, and, and part of the problem is these wars do not have a clear military objective. And, and, and I think lacking a clear military objective, it's kind of hard for the military to say, we'll do it this way and it'll take this and this will be some of the consequences. When we're talking about trying to protect schools in Afghanistan for young women and trying to get people to move to agricultural products other than poppy and, and, and other things. I mean, this, this, these are not military objectives. And we're asking 19, 20 year olds to go over and try to counsel people through this and help them through it. And uh, it's not a, a good role for the military. They, they are trained and equipped and ready to go to war. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, you know, going to war means a different thing today than it than it did for uh, our our father's generation. I think it's a great way to end it. Um, thank you so much on behalf of the Rockefeller Center, the Dickey Center, the entire Dartmouth community, everybody in the audience. Uh, we really enjoyed it, you, having you here and learned a thank lot. You. Thank you. Thank you all.